Kunle, you, you used um, at some point a quote from the former mayor of Medellin, Fajardo, where you brought together two words which haven't been as present as one might imagine in a conference here at, at the Biennale, which is beauty and need. Right? You, you brought those two words together. Uh, you also showed us a video which, you know, just the music, but also what you see shows an, an emotion. I mean, you, you were happy there. You, I imagine you were tearful when you saw your floating structure sort of uh, appear. And I, I'd like to ask a little bit more now, part, you know, wh where, what is the role of the architect in terms of synthesis? And you know, maybe we can talk about this together. You know, where, where do you create also this passion through the making of space, through the making of, of architecture? I mean, the beauty and the need analogy, uh, Alejandro, you gave uh, Kunle the most difficult place to put an object, which is in the arches of one of the greatest architects of the world, San Sovino, I think I'm right, who created a building, which is uh, the dock area, which is the white marble thing, of which this is effectively an extension, which, like the Arsenale building, reflects beauty and need. It's, it's a very, very functional space, just as your school. Where do you, as an architect, where, where do you see that synthesis of create, bring these two worlds coming together, leaving out all the big global stuff, just go straight to your role as the architect? Well, I mean, I think for me, um, beauty is really about authenticity and, um, and about the capacity to um, orchestrate or synthesize these issues in a way that really um, comes together harmoniously. And um, the, the reference with uh, Sergio Fajardo is very important f for our work because we have um, we've realized that, you know, there's the, the inequality in the world is so huge, it's so diverse, and from the part of the world that we, c that we come from, um, you know, the, the rich and the poor, they are so far apart. apart. And um, for me, it's, it's I, I just refuse to accept that um, the poor or the needy do, uh, do not deserve something beautiful. I mean, I think they deserve, uh, even with our best efforts in, as architects, uh, where the, the gap is still so wide in trying to improve the quality of the built environment. So th it's, it's a basic requirement that when you're thinking the about... aspiration, yes. which we all accept. Right. But your skill, those right. of you, the three of you who work has been shown. Your skill yeah. is with modest resources, with some pieces of timber and not much yeah. more, you create something which is very beautiful and of course functional. Yeah, so but talk it wasn't, about that. Yeah, I mean, we but didn't that wasn't start, the starting point. No, never a starting point. I mean, nothing about the floating school was intended as a beautiful object. You know, it's the material was found locally. The, 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 the way it's built is the same way that the community builds their timber, their, their uh, houses, uh, techniques of building. Uh, it's a triangle because it's the most rigid structure and the best structure for flotation and balance. You know, it's, uh, it's triangulated like that because it's a rigid uh, frame. So we, we didn't start out, we're actually quite surprised it was beautiful. No. I don't believe that for a moment, but anyway, <laughs> I don't believe that. You are living also in Amsterdam yes. at the moment. Can you imagine that this is also fruitful for cities like uh, in Amsterdam or Europe, etc.? And this is also the question to us all, because this, these systems that we have are so severe, also economically. Uh, and, and, that is the question to me, the spontaneous actions, I love them, really. But can we help us ourselves by evading into another uh, uh, meaning that you, you post also, this, this urban design is an architecture on a big, on a big uh, uh, level. Do you think that these incidents can 
help us because these are incidents. Cool. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. I think um, like I, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. And the that. question is yeah. that our systems yeah. that we are dealing with in right. Europe, in Europe, yeah. for instance, also in your countries, right. are so severe, so dense, right, right, that okay. to escape on it by incidents, and I love the incidents, we love it, of course. Mm -hmm. How uh, t do you see, do you see a manner to change these systems by using these methods? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think the, n the knowledge or the, the, um, the, these extreme conditions, as, you, as uh, Rahul kind of uh, mentioned, are places that we can learn from. And whether, um, but who has to learn? The architect? Uh, yeah, well, because we know it. Uh, we can say we have these uh, exceptions. Mm -hmm. And you also showed this one, mm -hmm. spontaneous and so on. Yeah. Who has to accept this? Uh, I mean, I think all of us. Uh, so I think, I mean, my argument was in the same way as I was arguing that you decouple aesthetics from um, some of these notions, uh, you, we have to also decouple what is urban design, urban interventions from just the architectural object, which is why then the synthesis as a definition becomes important. So for me, that is urban design. Uh, I think what Alejandro showed us is urban design. It is, uh, it is when we begin to, as practitioners, whether we come from the discipline of architecture or planning, we begin to create these bridge practices which, which, which go across. I mean, I think that is the learning. Uh, and that is when we can take these multiple forces and synthesize them. Uh, and that involves advocacy. I mean, what you showed us and what Alejandro has done is advocacy. It is about, uh, it's making those bridges between design and communities, between design and forces, between designs and frugality of, of, of resources uh, and all of that. So I think we have to, I think the metaphor for us as practice should be the bridging metaphor uh, more than anything else. Otherwise, we make our practices autonomous, uh, and then you get the autonomy of the object in architecture. So I think it's the learning at those levels from these interventions yeah. that I think become more critical than uh, the object itself, um, yeah. you know, as a design. We're yeah. about to wind up. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. I think um, it's, it's really just the, uh, the opportunity to think and expand and uh, for me the most important thing is ac action you know that we we can talk about things we can theorize things but we really need to put things into action and uh, that's the most important uh, step for uh, uh, development Bil <clears throat> building building on on that the the way we act as architects is through design. So uh, I, mean, I just w may want to, to share now a very specific kind of uh, contribution from our first project in Iquique. Uh, I could, I, unfortunately, you won't be able to, to see this, but um, you know, traditionally in, a, in an urbanization, the notion of efficiency of, uh, for lots subdivision is a rectangle. So a narrow front and a deep, uh, some depth for a given amount of square meters. And this is the, notion, the conventional notion of efficiency. If you're trying to achieve efficiency there, because we need a density to pay for expensive land in the center of the city, instead of expend, expelling people to the periphery, we, we follow that, that conventional notion of efficiency, we could accommodate 30, 60 families out of the 100 families, which was not only a social problem, but mainly because of the subsidies of the families, if we didn't include the 100 families, we didn't have the money for buy the land. So the specific way was that originally there was a street that was illegally taken by families 30 years ago, and the plot or the, the block was unfortunately not the regular one for which this notion of efficiency makes sense, but we had to choose a square lot instead of a rectangle. And a square for a developer 
is a, a no-go thing. I mean, this extremely inefficient, too much front for a given amount of pipes and everything. But in the case we had, only the square could rotate whenever you arrived to a corner. And in this plot, we had too many corners. So we had to come up with an, a kind of inefficient form for the conventional notion of efficiency, but this is the kind of things that we have been exercising in schools, how to cover a surface with a given geometric form. And this kind of knowledge, in the end, which is a kind of formal operation, had, to, had consequences in the amount of people that you could accommodate and integrate into the city and the network of opportunities of the city. So it was not tested in terms of the square is more stable or it will provide a whatever kind of aesthetic consequences, but it was an economical operation that in the end allowed that this family, and, uh, and we was uh, telling you uh, a couple of months ago, one of the leaders, this was in 2004, one of the women uh, came to the office uh, and said that a couple of families uh, sold one of the houses that happened to be in the center of the city. And I asked them for how much. The, the starting point of this, um, oh, there. Yeah, go on, yeah. two seconds. Um, the, the, the constraints yes. that we worked with were $7,500 with which we had to buy the land, provide the infrastructure, and build the house. Mm -hmm. Out of the $7,500, 7,200 was subsidy from the state, $300 was family savings. So actually, each family paid $300 for that housing unit. So we asked, for how much did you sell, the, did this family sell the units? $65,000. <laughs> so that means that with the right design, in the right place, if you consider architecture not an extra cost, but an added value that was able to make an efficient use of scarce resources, the transfer of public money into a family asset allowed these families to finally choose. These families never, ever in their life chose what to eat, what to wear, not to mention where to live. Finally, through architecture, and this I would say is the role of the sign, this family now with $65,000 in their pocket can choose as any other citizen in the society, what to do with what, their life. What we've heard now, Alejandro, is the description of your triangle. Yes. Design, regulation, and value. We're going to end this here, but it's an extraordinary moment for the urban age. As Philip knows, we've had someone drawing at the table. <laughs> we've linked the physical to the social, finally. Thank you very much.